And I guess I'm in, <laughs> he's speaking English now. Uh, I'm with Bill Hassan, who we met last night. He's so kindly offered to take me uh, from Radis into the center of uh, Tunis today. I've got a couple errands I need to take care of to arrange for my travels that are coming up. Stopping by some embassies, getting some visas if necessary, and some paperwork done. Other than that, I am free today to explore the capital of Tunisia, Tunis City. I think we've got some stops planned uh, right in the center of the city, the old town, the Medina. Then we'll end the day down by the sea. So really looking forward to it today. Welcome to downtown Tunis, everyone. Walking around trying to find a photographer. And it's turning out a bit more difficult than I expected. <laughs> but the funny thing is that whenever I try to look on Google Maps, I'm always finding one at the intersection of the first one was Gandhi Street. Now the other one that I'm trying to find is on the intersection of India Street, Rue de Land. So walking down there and hopefully I can actually find something there and I can get my uh, visa photos taken. I'm going to show you a little bit of what the streets look like here. They definitely look like most North African cities. You've got the French style, uh, large buildings, tree-lined streets, in the nice areas at least. Make mixed with businesses on the ground floor level with residences up above. Okay, so no luck. The, the India Street uh, photographer was actually closed, but I asked some guys who were standing outside and they said that there is another studio just a couple blocks away, so I'm gonna go check that one out. So I checked out the map and it looks like I'm actually walking toward the area where a lot of the embassies are and I need to head that way anyway. Definitely noticing that the neighborhood is getting pretty nice. A lot of nice businesses around. It's like a pretty upscale area and that's typically what you'll find in places as, you, as soon as you're getting closer to the diplomatic zone. So, so far Gandhi Street, India Street have not worked out for me, but I looked, checked Google Maps and the photographer that those guys alerted me to is actually on Palestine Street. So see if Palestine will come through for me. Stopping by at this park for a second, since the photographer told me that there's apparently a strike on public transport, so it might be difficult to find a taxi bus. The photographer was actually really cool. Uh, he said that he guessed that I was either from the Gulf or India, and then when I confirmed that I'm of Indian origin, of course I got the whole like, oh, you look just like Shah Khan kind of thing. That's very, very common here in North Africa, and I'm pretty sure in West Africa as well. Other than that, the weather here is gorgeous. It's about to be a high of 82 degrees here. So at least in the morning right now, there's a breeze from the sea and it's pretty nice. But it apparently should not be like that this late in the year. Everyone's saying that it should be a bit cooler and rainy by November, but that's apparently not the case. So after a bit of an adventure at the uh, diplomatic zone at the Embassy of Mali, which I'll recount later once we sit down, have some tea, get some rest, we're actually in the historic center, which is known as the Medina, as most Arab Islamic historical towns are known. Medina of Tunis. This historic old city really found its own when it was one of the largest medinas under the Al Muwahhid dynasty. And that was a dynasty that ruled over North Africa and was a Berber uh, or Amazigh, as they prefer to be called, dynasty. Tunis actually served as the capital of its Ifriqiya province during that time. We're outside the Yusuf Day Mosque. And if you take a look at it, it actually resembles a lot of the mosques that you would see in Turkey and in Istanbul. That's because it's one of the first mosques from the Turkish Ottoman period. So behind me, you see some of the ornate arches of the Sulk al Barqa. Uh, this was also inaugurated by Yusuf Day. And this name, you're going to see it often here in Tunis. 
because he was one of the Ottoman rulers of the area. This souk was actually a slave market at one period before it became a jewelry market in the 19th century. Uh, but so far, Tunisia has been amazing. I know sitting down with the guys yesterday at the cafe, I had them highlight some of the things that they love about their country, but it would be biased to say that it was all highlights for them. When I asked if any of them wanted to leave Tunisia, I think all of them said yes. Most of the basic goods are subsidized, such as sugar, milk, uh, gas cylinders, and there is a shortage of all these basic items here. Just because the government is unable to pay for the subsidies that it's put in place, as well as the wages of government workers. So these items are being rationed. There seems to be a vacuum of leadership that the people can actually trust, not that they prefer the current government or the government that was thrown out recently. There just seems to be a certain way that things are done, and it's that way that is unbroken, regardless of the change in leadership. So a lot of people find themselves in a position where they are stuck, cannot change anything, which results in a brain drain as the people who have ideas but cannot seem to break the system are forced to leave the country. So many people in this country, especially young men, are either unemployed or underemployed. That you find a lot of people sitting idly at cafes watching the street go by. And that seems to be the daily, daily pastime. And it's not that they voluntarily want to be doing that. They know that it's for a lack of opportunities and lack of resources. At the same time, a lot of young people are unable to get married because it just costs more to be living in two households as opposed to be living in one household with your family. That's, you know, another TV you have to buy, another place you have to pay rent for, more utilities you're using, and that's just not sustainable in this economy. Nonetheless, I think uh, the Tunisians, especially those of my generation, understand the power of community. Uh, they've lived in the same town, they know that their friends are going to be there, uh, and that the strength is really in the people. Turin saw this cafe and it is incredible. I just walked in, there's this classic Arabic music playing, it's a wonderful aesthetic ambiance, and I literally feel like I'm being transported to Ottoman era Tunisia right now. This is absolutely incredible. And before I enjoy my coffee, let me just tell you exactly what happened at the Mali embassy. I figured I could get an embassy to Mali by just dropping in and handing them a passport and maybe they would give me an, a, a visa later today. I was taken through all levels of the authorities here. They all said, no, we only issue visas to people who like live in Tunisia. You should have gotten it before you left the US. So for now, I think I'm just gonna like leave the idea of visiting Mali behind. I don't think it's really worth it at the moment. The funny thing was eventually I was about to leave and then the secretary was like, hey, you know, did you get your visa? And I said, no. And then he's like, oh, wait, just wait a minute. So he talked to the ambassador and the ambassador was like, and he told me to come back inside. So I was led into the room. I was not expecting to see the ambassador sitting there. And I walk in kind of casually with my hands in my pockets. And he tells me in French, uh, what is this? Is this how you respect the authorities with your hands, walking in with your hands in your pockets? But then again, I guess my uh, notion of formality and conduct is a bit ruined after living in Seattle and working from home. So definitely a cult piece of culture shock there. So we're on our way to the main mosque of the area, the Zaytuna Mosque. But to do that, we're passing through Souk al -Attarin. Attarin meaning from Ether. So Ether is the fragrance that you use to obviously smell nice. Uh, and so this souk is all specialized in beauty products, cosmetics, and things that smell nice. And you can really smell it when you're here. <laughs> Looks like we're in the middle of a really crowded area of the souk here. And it might seem like you can easily get lost, which you definitely can. <laughs> but the city is actually laid out in really interesting ge geometrical shapes and they're not random, they actually make a lot of sense. And the streets are laid out such that different clans and families of people can live next to each other. And so it reflects a bit of the social structure. Mm -hmm. حارة اليهود اليهود اللي هربوا من إسبانيا جاءوا هنا وعملوا هدية لكومبلكس كنت لا سينا جوجوك كنت ما تعيش 
هذه تأسست عام 1662 على إيطاليين هاجروا من جنوب إيطاليا وجاءوا أقاموا هذه الكاتدرال فهمت الله وهذه في المجمل كانت تمر مراحل كانت كما مستشفى مونستير هو المبيت نتاع ليسور سجن للعبيد كونسولا كونسولا اسبانيا فهمت الله كنت نتبع تشوف واحد الباب هذوما هما اوسبيس اوبيتال بريزون اي كونسولا يعني الكنيسه دي مش مستخدمه مش مستخدمه من تو هذه شوف انت يمشي على كان وين نعملوا في القداس هذا مكان البريزبيتير البريزبيتير هو كم مونستير نقولوا في هذا اللي قال كان قبل حتى الاستقلال كان اسمه نهج الكنيسه بعد الاستقلال واش نهج جامع so here we are on the roof. Uh, you can see behind me we have the bell tower. Um, that was done manually, as I've sh as you'll see in the footage here. And when you're when you're on the roof here, you really get a sense of the shared heritage and the layers of history that exist in Tunis. So on this side behind me, you probably can't see it, but you see the French-built uh, cathedral. And then behind me, you might see it right here. There should be a white dome, and that's sort of the area which was called Harat al Yahud, that was the Jewish neighborhood. And behind me, you've got Zaytuna Mosque, as well as an, the, the Ottoman built uh, mosque over here. And then, if you come around this side, you're going to see another green dome, and the green dome is actually Maqbarat al Atraq, or I guess cemetery of, of the Turks when they were here. Each corner you turn there is a sign of a bygone civilization and know behind me you can even see uh, aqueducts which were used by the Romans to transport water to uh, the civilization down here really really incredible so right in the middle of the building is this piece of modern art and if you can take a guess as to what it symbolizes give you a little second here but you're going to see the symbols of three Abrahamic religions, which have played such a big part in Tun Tunis's history. So you see a cross, you see a bit of the Star of David, and you see uh, the crescent to represent those three religions and how they can coexist together. So I'm at the restaurant. I ordered the couscousia, a couscous. So I don't know if you can see it, but this is definitely a plate. Take a look at it. It's couscous, which is colored red with harissa or like the chili paste. It's a bit spicier and different of a flavor than what you would get in Morocco. And then it's got this full fish on it, which I don't doubt that it's fresh and looks like there's some vegetables underneath with the gravy. But I'm really excited to take a taste of this. Couscous is a really interesting texture. It's very soft. You can feel each grain individually and they take a lot of care and effort into making that happen. People take great care to cook it in, ver in various stages to get the couscous so that each grain comes out individually and it doesn't plump together and turn into a mush. So I'm gonna eat this and then hopefully by then it'll be 2 p.m. and we can go check out the Zaytuna Mosque. Just before the mosque opens, we're taking a tour of some of the maderis or schools. Uh, Tunisia used to be a center of not only religion but also education for the students who would come from all over North Africa to study at the Zaytuna Mosque, and they would also stay in the city. And this is a, an example of what a classroom might look like. This is one of the uh, madrasas which has turned into a cultural center and is no longer either a madrasa or a mosque. So I went to a nearby bathroom where there's fountains and you can clean your hands and feet to do wudu, the ritual of cleansing before you enter the mosque. And now, we are entering a Zaytuna Mosque. You can take a look at the minaret here. And here, just like everywhere else in Tunis, you get a sense of the layers of history. This isn't just a mosque, but it's called Masjid Zaytuna. Zaytuna meaning olive. And the story is that it was built on top of the basilica or tomb of a saint Olivia, and that's how you get the origin of that word, olive. You also have a bit of syncretism going on here. Again, you have these columns which are not typical of Islamic architecture. However, these are the columns which are ruins taken from the Roman site of Carthage, which isn't too far away. The early Muslims to North Africa knew that if you want to convert people 
to a new religion, you have to meet them where they're at. And so they incorporate aspects of existing traditions and civilizations in the area, like the columns from the Romans before them, placing it in the same position as uh, a Christian site, and then keeping its name. Uh, these are just ways in which religions and civilizations develop from one another, take from one another to form a shared story and heritage. The eventual result of these layers of history and influences on a place is that you have a uniquely Tunisian, uniquely North African form of Islam which develops. The Islam that you find here is not the Islam of the Arabian Peninsula, but it takes on its own shape, its own identity, its own beliefs, and its own look. So we've just left the Medina, all that chaos, but all that excitement, and it's almost like a world in and of itself. But we're at Bab al-Bahar right now. As you can see, there's this one of these entrances to the old city. However, currently it acts like a public square where people come together, walk around, meet one another. In this video, I hope you all got a sense of the microcosm, which is the Tunis Medina. In historic times, this would have been the entire city of Tunis, at least the entire Arab city of Tunis. However, it currently accounts for about one-tenth of the city's population. I'm right at Zahat al-Istiqlal, or Independence Square, and you see two very interesting but co-joined aspects of Tunisia here. One you've got behind me, which is the cathedral. It looks like a Catholic cathedral built by the French, and it's still operating. They still have services going on every week on Sundays, and it's open to the public every morning. I'm a bit too late to go check it out, but you see it right behind me, a pretty phenomenal. And then on this side, you've got Ibn Khaldun, who is a very famous early Islamic thinker, philosopher, historian. And on the statue is one of his quotes, al insan madani bitabe, which means humankind or man is civil or social or one part of a civil society by nature. So uh, it's really appropriate to have that quote um, and that figure here on the Sehat al -Istiklal. The strike uh, on transportation, buses, trains, taxis was definitely ongoing. It took a while for me to find a taxi that would bring me out here. But we're currently out in the suburbs of Tunis in Sidi Bou Said. Sidi Bou Said is one of the few towns in the world which has adopted this white and blue theme overlooking a sea. I guess it sounds familiar if you think about like Santorini. The blue and white theme here is not actually native to the town, but it was adopted in the 1920s when a European actually started uh, implementing this policy within the city. And so far it's become very, very popular as a tourist attraction. This town is about a 30 minute taxi ride outside central Tunis. But it's just like full of tourists, a lot of uh, European and local Tunisians as well. But other than that, all I basically see are coffee shops, restaurants, bars. Definitely is a wonderful little escape from the hustle and bustle of the city. I can see why people love to spend time here. I was looking for a spot where we could actually look at the sea. This uh, town, pretty much on the tip of Tunis, right towards the north or, um, on the Mediterranean Sea. So there should be beautiful, beautiful views. So this is the viewpoint over the Mediterranean Sea. And this is really what links Tunisia and Tunisians to their shared layers of history. We've got the Romans, Carthage, Christianity, Islam, the French, all joining Tunisia by way of this sea. And from the dawn of time until today still means so much to everybody. From this view, you not only see the sea, but you also see the little port. Each town and each neighborhood seems that's on the coast seems to have a port associated with it. This is the port of Sidi Bou Said. This one looks a lot less industrial and more luxury with boats, luxury boats, yachts, and the like. I can't imagine how much wealth is probably concentrated in this neighborhood of Tunis. Okay, I'm here in Sidi Bou Said and I, bet, I met a bunch of guys from Al-Jazair. They're convincing me that I need to visit Algeria, but I'm telling them it's been really, really tough for Americans to get a, uh, a visa. Italian? No, no, I'm just talking about Arabic or English. 
Kumatiami, signori. Eh? Kumatiami, signori. Ah, ne che ho. Non capito, non lo so, mi fai un duello lì. Duello? Non capito. Calli, 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 لا أنا من أصل هندي بس أتولدت في أمريكا وأنا درست بمصر والمغرب. ويكم 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 تواجد شوف إزاي زحمة هنا كلنا يفرقوا علي. وإحنا ندعو إخواننا الأمريكيين. لا لا أنا أنا ما رحت الجزائر أنا أنا قلت إن أنا عايز أزور الجزائر. مرحبا مرحبا. قلتلو أنا عندهم بروبلم تاع الفيزا. احنا شعر الجزائر مع الامريك ما عندهمش علاقه طويله. دي دي كاس دي دي كاس دي دي كاس دي كاس الهند نيو دلهي اه دلهي الهند خاوتنا وشيرو خان وتيكرو شا وجاني تو ونص الهند كل النجوم هذو كل النجوم في الهند نقولوا دوخت ما صدقك استعمار شكرا هيا تهلا بروحك يا سو اي هاف نو ايديا هاو اول ذات هابت It started out with me talking to three guys from Algeria. Telling, they were telling me that I need to visit and that no tourists go there because the government already has oil money so they don't really need to invest in bringing in foreign tourists, but that there is so much to see there. And then all of a sudden, I think we ran into their whole group and I was just bombarded by <laughs> a circle of really, really welcoming uh, Algerians. So my message to whoever is in control of the visa policy for these two countries, open it up so I can go fulfill my promise and uh, meet them in Jazeid. So there you have it. It's been a long, packed, but exciting and unexpected day here in Tunis. I really wasn't expecting this much from, from the capital. I thought it would be another boring capital city and you'd have to go to the other sites outside of the city for, for the real attractions. But there is everything here. There's old, there's new, there's the traditional stuff, there's the 21st century stuff, um, and people of all sorts. Right now I am uh, sitting on the steps of the mosque here in Sidi Bou Said. Everyone's coming out to go for their walks in the evening, and I think I'm going to catch a taxi uh, from right here and head back to Radis, uh, to my host family. We'll be having dinner together, and I'll say Good night to you all. If you appreciate this content at all, learn something new or something that you just found interesting, feel free to like this video, share it with your friends, subscribe to my channel. It definitely motivates me to edit this video and upload everything after a really long day of traveling. And this is only the first day, so I know it's gonna get a lot more crazy from here. So take care, everyone. Wow.